This is Co-Creator Network, New Thought Talk Radio that rocks. Welcome. I'm Dr. Jennifer Howard, the author of Your Ultimate Life Plan, and this is A Conscious Life. I'm so glad to have you here today. Thank you all for taking your time to be here and listen, and I hope that as we uh, hear these great speakers, and we have someone today who's wonderful. I think we don't have him yet, but that's he's coming. Um, we all learn to grow and, and learn from him and grow toward having a more conscious life. That's the way toward more freedom and happiness. And you can follow me today at Dr. Jennifer on Twitter, hashtag a conscious life, uh, and on Facebook forward slash uh, Dr. Jennifer fan page. Um, I'm real excited to be with you here today. We're continuing a part two of something that we started, uh, but I will introduce him when I know he's here. Um, So what I want to do is thank you all for your wonderful emails and comments and uh, things about my book, Your Ultimate Life Plan, your questions. I love them. They're wonderful. And I'm doing a continued promotion uh, for the people who are on you know, this radio show with us, uh, if you do doctor, uh, uh, your ultimate life plan.com forward slash launch, you can still download, uh, today. And when you're listening, uh, for this week, uh, those wonderful gifts that people gave me. So I understand we have, uh, our guest who I'm just thrilled to have back. So, uh, everybody, uh, let me know about the book and what your thoughts are. And, um, love hearing from you. So, yay! We have today, again, Andrew Harvey, an international acclaimed poet, novelist, translator, mystical scholar, and spiritual teacher. Harvey has published over 20 books, including The Hope, A Guide to Sacred Activism, and his newest book, which we're diving into, part two, uh, Radical Passion, Sacred Love and Wisdom in Action. Harvey was a fellow of All Souls College, Oxford from 72 to 86 and has taught Oxford University, Cornell University, the California Institute of Integral Studies, and the University of Creation Spirituality, as well as various spiritual centers throughout the U.S. He was the subject of the 1993 BBC film documentary, The Making of a Modern Mystic. He's the founder of the Institute for Sacred Activism, and his website is andrewharvey.net. Are you there? Andrew. I am, and how thrilling to be on this adventure again with you. Thank you so much for taking this book so seriously and allowing me to expand on (coughs) the messages that I hope it contains that can inspire people at this time. Oh, I'm just so thrilled to have you back, and and thanks for coming. And yes, we we barely got – I put a marker where we stopped, so we still have (laughs) – we still have lots to cover. Uh, Yes. Before we even, I mean, we were barely, I mean, we did skip around and do a few little things uh, later in the book, but we were pretty true to staying where we were, which was in chapter three. So those of you who haven't heard the first part of this, I'm sure he'll, you know, recycle back some of it, but you really need to go listen to the first one of these because he went into, it was so beautiful to hear him talk about the things we covered in the book and his first three, really the first two chapters, right? That's what we covered last time. (laughs) <laughs> so uh, so how are you, first of all? I'm absolutely wonderful. I'm just beginning one of the great adventures of my life because on Friday I go to Oakland to begin with Matt Fox, 13 <laughs> Initiations into the Christ Path, in which we're going to try and reinvent Christianity to help Christians come to a much more radical and much more vibrant understanding of the Christian mystical message of love in action. And anybody who wants to investigate what we're up to, go to ChristPathSeminar.org because we're offering the first weekend as a gift for only $50 so that people can truly, truly in the spirit of the Christ experience the teachings by the greatest living mystical theologian Matthew, Joanna Macy, and myself. So this is thrilling to me beyond belief. I'm hardly able to contain my excitement. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited. Oakland, I wish I could be there. Wow. Well, you don't have um, to be there because it's live streamed. You can have it as a podcast and also save it as you want. So we're doing it on every level to try and make the information as available to everybody at the least possible price. Because I think there's a new kind 
of sacred economy trying to be born, which is fundamentally a gift economy. And this is what we're trying to represent. So if this excites you out there, please, please join us. We really do need oh, I love this. to co-create this together with hundreds this and thousands is, of people. This is so important because I, I'm so happy you're saying this for so many levels because growing up Christian myself, uh, help. Um, <laughs> And Matthew Fox, I've had on the show. I adore him. I've seen him in person. Uh, of course, I've oh, met Matthew's you. Oh, a genius, yes. He's, he's amazing. And so are you. So what, a, ah, what an amazing. Uh, and, and if we don't do something for, uh, and to ignite Christianity into this new place, it's, it's really, uh, and I have this mark to talk about later, but I guess I'm jumping. Um, uh, the, fundam- the fundamentalism has really taken over, um, and that thinking is, is kind of dangerous. Well, it's psychotic. It's not just dangerous because <laughs> Jesus came for the whole world and the whole world needs to listen to the message of radical love in action. And what Jesus came to do was not found a religion with laws and dogmas, but to show the path that can help any human being birth the divine in them so that the divine can work through them to transform the planet. Exactly. And if Christianity said- considers, continues to be obsessed with dogmas, it will miss the whole point of Jesus' transmission, which is what it's done for so long. That is so sad to me. I, I, I love what you wrote about it. Uh, you were talking about this, exactly, we jumped in, we'll go back and get the other pieces, but uh, I love when you talk about the teaching of the Christian mystics and you say, um, this is the future for the planet. Um, uh, yeah, trying to figure out where to start writing. Yeah, a spiritual life in the West will continue to be superficial, narcissistic, and sometimes lethal mixture of watered down or or uh, fanatical pseudo Christian, hardly understood Eastern metaphysics and regressive occultism, uh, and the great radical potential of such renaissance will go unlived. And you go on, but it's yes, yes. Well, no, it's because you see what's being born now is a universal mysticism in which the Deep revelations of all of the traditions are coming together. But if there isn't the voice of the Christ in there, then it will remain at a transcendental level rather than actually transform these living, terrible conditions. Because what makes Jesus unique, it doesn't mean that he's the only or the, the only person you should ever listen to. It, what makes him as unique is that he focuses transcendent understanding and love on real, radical, transformative action of the real world. So Jesus is the reality principle at the core of evolution. So without hearing the authentic voice of the Christ, the opportunity that this universal mystical birth gives us of going to a whole new level in our evolutionary development will go unlived. Because Jesus is the one who says to everybody, Buddhists, Christians, go-go dancers, cabaret artists, <laughs> everybody, if you love God in whatever way you understand God, then show me, make it real, risk it, go for it, put it into action. Mm-hmm. You don't have to be a Christian to hear that message. You have to be a human being awake to the agony of the world, awake to the possibility of a wholly new level of evolution for yourself, and awake to the understanding that that new level of evolution can only happen if you bring together the deepest spiritual consciousness and mystical understanding and strength and peace with a clear, wise, radical commitment to action. Well, it's uh, somewhere here, and I'm, I'm not able to f- find things fast enough, but y- you quoted the Dalai Lama somewhere toward this back section where he said that exactly, that that's the task of human beings. Is yes, to- because the Dalai Lama is representing that vision in the Buddhist tradition. He's a Mahayana Buddhist, and at the core of Mahayana Buddhism is an ideal that was historically very influenced by the Christ, the ideal of the Bodhisattva. And the Bodhisattva is a person who commits himself or herself to doing everything to transform the creation, the whole world, to liberate all beings, and makes the vow, which is perhaps the most intense vow that any human being can make, to come back again and again and again until the end of time to help all beings enter into liberation, even the blades of grass and the animals and the mice, 
And that's the vow that His Holiness has taken, and He has come back again and again. And it's that vow that the love in us is longing to take, and it's only when you can take a vow like that that you'll do anything to represent love in this world that you can be free. Well, I'll, I, signed, I think I signed up a while back. <laughs> yes, I think you did, and it's <laughs> what people need to really get and I think more and more people are getting it, is that this isn't a miserable choice. This isn't a choice of, oh my God, I've got to be a slave for the rest of my life and all the other lives. This is a choice of tremendous passion leading to unimaginable joy because when you serve the divine purpose in evolution to build the kingdom queendom on earth, to really help all beings rise to the next level and co-create with God a new way of being and doing everything, then you're serving the deepest purposes of evolution, and that will reward you with the most extraordinary mischief, fun, joy, and rapture at the core of your life. Mm. Oh, lovely. You know, uh, Andrew, are, are you okay with us taking a question, or do you want to keep us on track here? What would you prefer? We have somebody who'd like to ask yes, you a question. Uh, well, let's have a question. That would be wonderful. Oh, excellent. Okay. And so let's go I just, back after the question. Okay, okay, and then we'll pick right back up. I'd like to start. Well, it depends on where he leads us. I mean, what, what he says that we go yes. off of. But, but I'd like you to talk about some of the essential mystics and the Hindu mystics. You haven't, you said some beautiful things in there I don't want to miss out. No, let's do it. So, okay. So, uh, yes, we'll have, um, you can connect us to the caller. Hello, okay. David. Hi, Hi, David. How, How's to it going? You. We're doing great. How are you? Oh, very good. Um, I, I first of all want to say, Andrew, that I'm a huge fan of uh, both you and, of course, uh, Dr. Howard. Um, you know, I was very delighted um, when, um, you know, to, to hear that you were going to be speaking uh, on the show. And, of course, um, you know, Dr. Howard, you have wonderful stuff. I love your site. And, of course, I love following you on Twitter. Um, I, my question is, is somewhat basic, but, it, it, but it's, it, it's a pretty valid question. Um, you know, when you first start to follow a mindfulness path, you know, I really do feel that it's kind of a calling, and I wonder oh, yeah. how much choice is involved and um, how much is, is something that you're guided to do by your higher self. When did you start becoming interested in mindfulness, and do you feel that it was a calling for you, or do you feel it was a conscious choice? Either way, you have wonderful results. <laughs> Thank you, David, so much What's for calling in. What's a very fascinating remark. I think, that, um, I think that the answer is both. I think that we're born into this experience to embody the transcendent. That is the true meaning of life. When I asked the Dalai Lama once, what is the meaning of life? He said, the meaning of life is to embody the transcendent, to bring in the transcendent beauty, power, and grace. So that's our fundamental purpose, and it's the fundamental purpose, I think, of every human being. But I think over many lifetimes, this is my perspective, that intention grows so that in, if you're very blessed and lucky, then in one lifetime, you really choose that intention as the core focus of your whole life. And it's in that lifetime that you can do the most inner work and be most outwardly effective. I love that answer. Oh, thank you, David. Nice. Oh, thank you so much. You guys have a wonderful day. And um, it, like I said, Andrew, it, keep up the good work. And Dr. Howard, thank you. It was a pleasure. Oh, you're My so pleasure. welcome. Nice to connect to you. <laughs> Our pleasure. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. We'll talk on Twitter. <laughs> oh, I loved it. You know, it brings tears to my eyes, Andrew, when you were saying that, because I, you know, I, I, I'm, that's, I'm, know your goal and certainly my goal and and everybody I try to have on the show's goal uh, uh, is you know really to do this this lot to help everyone as much as we can lead people through the blindness hopefully see their blindness where they're not seeing that they can open to all that is this and commit well, it's to this very important that we start with ourselves isn't it? because That's we're right. also limited and restricted and blind in many ways until we're not and we can use our understanding of our own shadow and our own resistances and our own terrors and our own fears and our own vulnerabilities 
to lovingly and deeply and firmly and sweetly and wisely guide other people through theirs. So we're really doing it all together, aren't we? Yes, we are. That's uh, Thank you for saying that. Absolutely. I mean, I've done a lot of work on myself. I think therapy for 25 years. But uh, yeah. – <laughs> And lots of other things. So, um, yeah, that continue and continue to look. And I think, you know, once you, once I stepped into the teaching arena of publishing this book, and I'd been teaching before, but really publishing a book, it's a whole other level that opens up for me to heal in me. You know, yes. that, uh, yeah. that's very important because what you're doing is actually stepping forward as a sacred activist and with the powers you have and manifesting your power. And that brings up all kinds of shadow issues. Am I worthy? Yes. Can I really do it? Am I adequate? Yes. Am I strong enough? Will yes. I fail? Will something pop up from my psyche that makes me into a monster instead of a guide? You know, all of those questions come up, and they're very important. And I think they do for all our listeners, too, in their own way. Each time we step yes. into our, to our task, to our power, we say yes to God. Every time we say yes, um, I'm thinking about consenting, I'm thinking about Father Thomas Keating now, every time we consent, we open ourselves up to this flood of all of us, which includes the shadow. Yes, because every time you say yes, you're like Mary at 12 in that room in Nazareth when the angel appeared to her and said, will you go through whatever you have to go through to birth this being? And if you say yes, then you will be given everything that you need to birth it. But you will tremble and you will fail sometimes and you will make mistakes. But the most amazing thing that becomes clear over the path is that you will be helped and forgiven and transformed at every level by infinite love. And infinite love will always be there to guide you and correct you and sustain you and inspire you. Mm. Yes, I'm just uh, feeling that in my body. Yes. I, uh, just to go back now, if we don't mind, to the Hindu mysticism. I, I read this part. It's so sweet. Uh, your own um, experience with, first of all, it's not called Hinduism. So that's the first thing we learn in this teachings of the Hindu mystics on page 189. Uh, but your own uh, memories as a boy with these colors, and you write it so beautifully, but the sounds of the temple yes, bells echoing. Yes, I was echoing. born in India, and India has informed everything, of course. Mm. Now, tell me about what, when did you move to England, and when were you in India? I was born in India on June the 9th, 1952, mm-hmm. and I spent the first nine years of my life in India. Mm. So my whole being, my whole psyche, my whole mission, my whole passion for God, have been infiltrated at the deepest levels by what I experienced as a child in India. Mm -hmm. And India gave me three related things. It gave me a vision of the entire world as sacred, because for the Indians, everything is sacred. Mm -hmm. Leaves are sacred, cows are sacred, all beings are sacred, all religions are sacred, because Hinduism is... but really sanctifies all paths and blesses all paths because Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, all things lead to me. Mm. And the second thing that India gave me was a sense of the infinite ways that the divine can be approached. I was born in a Protestant family. I had a Catholic nanny. I had a Hindu cook and I had a Muslim driver. So, Very early on, before I could formulate it, I was initiated into the oneness of reality, into the oneness of the divine, and into the way in which all religions are like different colored panes of glass through which the same light is pouring into the human room. Absolutely. And the third thing that India gave me was an understanding of the role of horror and darkness and death and pain and suffering in the great alchemy of the transformation of the human into the divine human because you can't be a child in India and not notice the lepers and not notice and bleed and suffer for the poor and not notice the terrible inequality and not notice the enormous, enormous anguish Mm. and yet 
being in that sacred world and in that sacred context, you come to understand that what you're witnessing is the dance of opposites in reality. Yes, yes. So because of my childhood, I have never bought the version of God as only love, joy, light. God is also chaos and horror and darkness. There is one divine energy that works through the opposites. And this is the great strength of Hinduism and the great strength of all authentic mysticisms is that they face that the God has a dark side, that the, the light and the dark are both sacred and holy. Mm-hmm. And India can initiate you into that in the most radical way. And I think that's why to do the work I have been invited and cajoled by God to do, that's why I was born there, so that I would have that non-dual understanding of the dance of opposites at the very beginning. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I just, uh, that is amazing. What a great story. Um, I'm just feeling that too. I'm just imagining you as this little boy taking all that in. That was, um, that was helpful for you. It was terrible and wonderful. I'll give you an illustration which will get it very exactly. Good. I was, say, six years old and I was living in Old Delhi. And this happened to me on the same afternoon. So when, about four o'clock, I went out with my nurse into the wilderness behind the house, and about 40 peacocks suddenly appeared and spread their fans in that wilderness. So I was surrounded by glory, 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 beauty, beauty, beauty. Wow. Later that afternoon, my parents went away, leaving me in the house. And I was sleeping in my parents' bed and woken up by the most terrible sound I've ever heard, and I can still hear it. And it was a sound of absolute agony. And in the morning, I didn't sleep. It had gone on all night. I saw a little dog being strapped to a bicycle with its mouth just a huge mop of foam, and that dog had gone mad. It was rabid. And they were taking that dog to drown it because that's the only way they could think of dealing with it. And I'd seen a film about rabies and knew already that rabies can be transmitted by water. So Uh not only had I experienced the horror of the dog's agony, but also the horror of what potentially could happen if they drowned that dog and that that could spread rabies to millions. So on the same day, both the glory and the horror. That's India. Wow. Wow. It was such a great setup for you to become who you are now, to become this teacher that you are. It was like setting the groundwork for you to have these experiences so you could speak to this kind of passion and understanding and depth of shadow uh, at an early age. So it allowed you to write those books earlier than you know, this this life, and probably this is also coming from other lives of already having worked with this material and, and um, you well, know, just trying... Well, this try- is the life in which I had to bring it together to help the planet, and I had to be put through very terrible ordeals to be able to do so because the planet is going through a death process. But I also had to learn in my very bones that death is the prelude to birth, that crucifixion is the condition of resurrection. The darkness gives birth in the end to an unimaginably greater light because the whole universe is this interrelated dance of opposites in what in which what we fear most can lead us to what we most need and in what we think of as the worst that happens to us can actually be the prelude to a best which in our previous consciousness we couldn't even begin to imagine. And this is the key, I believe, to the great evolutionary process that we're going through Everything that we are most terrified is now manifesting in the world. And there are many, many parts of us which says, oh, my God, I'm in despair. I have to turn away or I have to die or it's too awful. Well, the wise part of ourselves, the part that is awake to non-dual evolution, can say, if things are this bad, it's only because something amazing is trying to be born through a shattering of the old. And this is what governs my work. This is what governs my mind and heart. This is what is the deepest intuition at the core of everything I do. Well, and when you say the shattering, I think about the Kabbalah, which is coming up uh, 
fairly next in this. Uh, yes. You know, I think about the shattering, the way the, the uh, it's told, how the earth shattered three, you know, the three times in, in creation and finally. Yes, uh, the vessel shattered and then their pieces went into the creation and then through tikkun, through sacred action, right. that we take those shattered pieces and make them whole and raise them back into the Godhead. So that places an enormous responsibility on the human because the human is the force in this matter sent by the divine to restore the wholeness of the divine in matter and in the world. Isn't it an amazing vision? It's an amazing vision, and it feels like that vision in the Kabbalah reminds me in a funny way of the vision of Christ and yes. the death and the resurrection. It's a similar kind of falling into chaos, you know, like you were talking about, back into wholeness. Well, there's only and one reality, and that's the phenomenology of the transformation. And when a great being comes into the field of evolutionary change, they always go through the same death, rebirth, crucifixion, resurrection process. Jesus was representing that at the highest level, but everybody who comes into that field goes through the same Jesus process. So whether it's in shamanism, when people go through the death, rebirth process, you'll see that process in all the authentic mystical systems because it is the process. It doesn't belong right. to any religion. It is the process of the divine being born in the human. And don't you think there's, I was thinking about this when I was reading this today, um, again, just reabsorbing so I could, you know, be familiar with the questions. And uh, don't you, you think that, oh, you're welcome. Um, don't you think we do those, th th that happens in a small way all the time, doesn't it? Yes. It happens with every breath. <laughs> every breath you live and die. Huh. Huh. And there's a shattering, you know, and uh, coming back together and a letting go. Even the breath, like when you exhale, yes. <sighs> you have to let go, It don't is you? the law of your whole being. You're living and dying at the same moment. Mm -hmm. If you stop breathing, you die. But breathing out, you're closer to death. It's a mad, wonderful, gorgeous paradox. <laughs> yes, it is. Oh. Yeah, I love also, this. also, I think that every, every moment... You have a choice. Are you going to be stuck in your definition of things, in your concepts, in your anxieties, in your fears, in your desires for how things should go? Or are you going to let yourself be naked to the moment? If you stay in your concepts and anxieties and your ego, you're really living a form of death. If you clarify yourself and just enter naked into the nakedness of the moment, you are symbolically and actually entering into the eternal life that is the only reality. That is why all the great sages of all the traditions have said that the ultimate awakening is to live in total presence to the moment. Because there is only the moment. There is only one moment ever happening because eternity isn't endless duration. Eternity is total presence. Right. And you're dying to each moment. Yes. In the nakedness, so you can be present. So you're there. Yes. Yeah. Wow. I just want my listeners so in, to feel that. If you're living authentically, you're enacting the death rebirth process by breathing, by constantly overcoming and purifying your own obsessiveness to enter into the purity of moment, to be with things exactly as they are in compassionate, lucid, illumined awareness. This See, is the great strength of Eckhart Tolle's work, I think, is that he's been able to present this beautiful, holy truth to the world in a way that everybody can get. If well, they but want I, to. What I like about what you say, though, is you make it clear that you still have to do purification work. And I think a lot, some of the teaching that's coming out right now oh, basically yes, doesn't doesn't talk about that, that, you, that there's not that still to do. You don't have to worry about that. Just go to the oneness or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah, absolutely. There's, that is radioactive nonsense because you can have a million experiences of oneness and then your shadow or your pissed offness or your anger can make you the stupidest person in the world. You can go from one moment for being the most awake person to the most abject, idiotic person. And anybody who's honest about themselves knows that they may do that 52 times a day. So you have to work constantly on everything in you that obstructs love, everything in you that prevents you from being in the presence you know you are, and you have to stay 
radically humble practicing being in the presence so that you can be in it more and more and more. There is no end to this process. There's no stage you get to where you are just enlightened forever and ever and ever. Enlightenment isn't a static thing. It's a, a field, a dynamic field of transformation. You enter, and if you do have the humility and the practices and the psychological skill to work constantly with the things in you that you know from your karma, from your childhood, have damaged you, have limited you, have made you neurotic, have made you obsessive, then you have an immense opportunity to become more and more integrated into the one. But nobody is finally one with the one. This is nonsense. Even the angels at the highest levels are still evolving into ever more profound unities with a unity that is unfathomably mysterious and greater than anything that any of us can possibly ever begin to begin to begin to imagine. Mm. So this idea that you can just swoop into oneness like you can take a plane to Tahiti is an idiotic idea. This is an endless work which gets ever more refined and ever more extraordinary and takes a great deal of humility and sweat and discipline and humor. (laughs) (laughs) Thank God for humor. Exactly. Yeah, thank God. I, I have to laugh at myself a lot. Um, and yes, and I think the further you, you know, commit in this, sometimes the harder the challenges, sometimes the darker the dark night, don't you think? Oh, of course. It's, uh, but that's what you have to be prepared for. That's what I, that's my beef against this new age nonsense, because the new age says, basically, you don't, is it New Age has absolute horror of, of the four more, most essential words in the real mystical part, suffering, service, sacrifice, and I can't remember what the fourth one was. That's but all right. Uh-huh. That's enough, isn't it? Yeah, it's, because it is. Because <laughs> you have to be prepared as you grow to assume more and more responsibility. You're not, you know, the New Age believes that we are these infinitely entitled children who can just stamp our feet and get what we want. But the divine plan is very different, it seems. It seems that what we're being asked to do is to embody the divine and go through whatever ordeals are necessary for us to get radically imbued with divine truth, divine passion, divine peace. And that means that every advance we make is going to have an additional responsibility. If you are a prince, you have the responsibilities of a prince, but when you become a king or a queen, you have to take over the responsibilities of the whole kingdom, kingdom. And that means suffering with your subjects, suffering with everybody. The royalty comes with the most intense service, and then we're all born to be royal in this way. And the greater the royalty, the more the suffering, the more the responsibility, But instead of it being a suffering that you take on with the ego, it's a suffering that you learn how to be brave enough to accept as the price for the great bliss and joy that are also given you. And instead of the responsibility being taken on just from the private self, you realize that it is a responsibility given to you as a divine being and that you're supported and sustained by divine grace in that responsibility and that if you hand it over to the divine, it will help you enact that responsibility with the clarity and the wisdom and the radical humility that you are going to need to be truly effective. Mm. I'm just thinking about that radical humility and how uh, moving into the marketplace with this book, it's this weird PR is so weird. You're supposed to tell them all the things that are great about you. And then if you come, if you, I mean, I had an interaction with somebody on a, on a radio show that I was, it wasn't my radio show. I was on theirs and I kind of just, you know, was really just kind of humble and just me. And then I could feel her feeling like I wasn't good enough. It was so fascinating. (laughs) And then you can feel your own desire to prove yourself to be good enough, which is when you become part of the. Right. Great brothel of capitalism trying to sell your wares in the vast bazaar. That's terrible. It's terribly shaming, isn't it? It's really hard. You know, it's so, yep. So how do you, you know, own your humility but still make a book sell so people know they can read it and be helped? 
<laughs> well, I think you have to define humility in a proper way. I don't think humility is what it's been characterized to be. I don't think humility is playing small. Yes, and I don't yes. think humility is self-effacement. I think real humility is having the courage to see what you are through God's grace, to acknowledge what God has given you, to celebrate what you've been able to do, not as Andrew Harvey, but as someone who has been given the grace by God to enact certain things. So it takes a fundamental shift in the core of your being, and then when you make that shift, you are able to really stand in the core of what you're able to offer, not from a position of vanity or saying only I can do this, but from a position of humble gratitude to the divine that has given you this portion of the work to do. And when you stand in that, you'll find exactly the right tone, which will neither be, I'm the best, buy my book, you have to, otherwise you'll die, and all the other books and all the other writers are just idiots, <laughs> which will only be temporarily effective. Right. You'll be able to really stand in the true position, which is the position of radical gratitude for what you've been enabled to do, and radical certainty about the value of what you have to offer, not as you, but as an agent of the God that gave this to you to offer. So what you're saying is, is humility, from what you're talking about, is really being able to hold the opposites. It's being able to hold our true power in the sense of that the grace is moving through us. And uh, Yes, because you, it isn't that you... Humility has been defined by the patriarchy as I'm just nothing and I'm nobody and the rest of it. That's not humility. That's their version of humility to keep us passive and unempowered. Real mm-hmm. humility is to admit the power that you have, but to make the most important distinction that you could, which is that that power does not belong to your ego. It is the radiation of your divine self, and it's a gift of grace. Mm-hmm. Is that clear to you? Does that make sense to you? Oh, it makes perfect sense. I mean, I also could feel it in my body when you were talking about it, you know, just... Uh... You know, this is like I'm new on this path uh, of teaching with a book. <laughs> so, uh, no, it's so a it's... very, very, it's a very important moment because I think that's what a lot of sacred activists are going to face. You know, when you do, when you step up, and when you start doing things in the world, and when you see that the world is as weird and corrupt and bizarre as it is, and that to go on doing things, you feel at times that you have to compromise or to explain things in ways that other people reach. These are the kinds of real riddles that everybody's going to face. But the only way you can get through them, I've found, and you will make mistakes, and I've made many of them, but that's okay because we learn through our mistakes. When you really do say to yourself, thank you, Lord, Mother, for having given me these things to do for you, and I do them only through your grace and by your grace. Help me find the tone. Help me find the way. Help me stay true to myself and reach as many people as possible. Then God will give you the... God will not only give you the tone and everything you ask for, but God will give you the circumstances in which that humble pride, that divine humility can work. It's so beautiful, and I'm looking at my notes of stuff. You I, I, is, is this divine childhood what you're talking about right now in a funny way? I think it is because I think divine childhood is total surrender to the divine. Right. And when you, the more you surrender, the more the divine can work through you to prepare for what you are doing in the name of the divine to reach as many people as possible in the ways that it's meant to reach. And you have to be patient because you may be given a vast vision and mission and you may be given it in a way that separates you from your fellow human beings for a very long time. And you may be given it in a time which is deaf to it for a very long time. Your job is to hold to it, to embody it, to become more and more humble to the grace that's giving you it and filling you with it, and to be absolutely patient for the time that can only be known by the divine when what you have been doing will be accessible. 
right. You've experienced that a lot, haven't you? Because you've gone through, you know, writing all those books about Mother Mira and all those different phases you've been through. You've really had to do this, and you've done it publicly, bless your sweetheart, so the rest of us could learn, you know? Well, it was unavoidable, I'm, yes, and I feel that what has happened to me is what happens to so many people who have the terrible and wonderful grace of of carrying a portion of this great adventure we're on, is that yes. you're ahead of the curve, yes. and you have to be patient enough and humble enough to wait for the others to catch up. And it's not because they're ignorant idiots, it's because they're on a different evolutionary trajectory and the world is in a terrible mess. And God is doing the transformation in God's own mysterious and amazing way, which is always wiser than anything you can come up with. (laughs) Uh, uh, This makes me think of when you, uh, I'm just kind of moving in the book because I want everybody to hear these things that you say that are so beautiful. Um, uh, this makes me think of the 72 veils of illusion. You talk about the false self uh, on 200, uh, 283. Yes, this is the Sufi vision that there are 72 veils between ourself and ourself. <laughs> yes. Yes. 72,000 veils. What does that phrase evoke in you? Say that again, Andrew, I'm sorry. What does that phrase evoke in you? It's a very rigorous statement, isn't it? Well, it's like I hope I have enough lo- uh, enough life left in me uh, years uh, to to kind of go through you know a couple more thousand anyway. <laughs> it's like oh, well, I don't know. It, well, I think it. Well, in the way you see the paradox is that a part of you is already there. Right. The other is the other part is trying to catch up with where you already are. <laughs> so the more mm-hmm. profound your immersion in your true self. The quicker those veils can burn, they could burn in an hour, or they could take ten thousand lifetimes. It's well, your I, you know, I don't get discouraged easily. So, what it makes me feel like is rolling up my sleeves. Well, I'll tell you a story <laughs> which would massively encourage you. Shall I do that? And everybody ah. listening, ah, this yes. is my one of my absolute favorite stories. This is a story told in the Shaivite tradition, and it's about Lord Shiva. So. Yes. Lord Shiva is walking around, right? And he goes to a great sage who's an amazing meditator. He says to this great sage, my dear man, in two lifetimes, you are going to be one with me. And the great sage is miserable because there, this great sage has been standing on one foot and meditating up a storm and helping everybody. And they've got two more lifetimes. So he falls into a depression. Well, Lord Shiva then goes on walking and finds a rather ditzy beggar dancing, singing his name in a clearing. He goes up to this ditzy beggar and says, Look, in 10,000 lifetimes, you are going to be one with me. And the beggar goes into ecstasy immediately and becomes one with Shiva. (laughs) You see, the sage is invested in his own enlightenment and think that he's doing it. The beggar is in love with Shiva, doesn't care how long it will take, which means that Shiva can, through grace, remove the last obstacles because the essential is there, which is the rapturous devotion to God. <laughs> I don't know why this is making me laugh hysterically. That is so well, funny. Well, it's all yes. about story, isn't it? We think we're it's... doing it, and if we're very good boys and girls, we're going to get it. That's all BS, because that means that we're the agents. We're not the agents. God is the agent. Right? Right. And if we can just surrender in devotion and just say, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know where I am. I may have some ideas from time to time and be given indications, you do with me what you will. Use me. That's all I ask. Mm. Then, miracles can happen. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, been my prayer for a long time. To show, show me the way. Show me the way. And then, of course, I get Robbing stubborn you. and do it my way right after that. God, I mean, it's what Jesus says in Gethsemane, not my will, but your will. 
if you wish me to stay around being an idiot for another few lifetimes and helping other people through my mistakes, I'll make them and fall apart and help. If you wish to give me enlightenment now, I'll accept it. But it's up to you. You do it. I no longer want to have my will interfering with what you want to do with me and through me. And at that moment, you're already very, very close to awakening. And the more you deepen that surrender, the more obvious that awakening will become in you and to you. Mm. Just feels so um, great. I hope everybody's feeling your words as, as much as hearing them too, because you're really giving us a transmission today, which I'm just very grateful for. Oh, I'm, I'm, it's wonderful to talk to you. You're such a lovely person. You can't, you know, the wonderful thing about this new journey of evolution that we're on is that nobody has the whole truth. We're all in this together. And when two lovers of God meet, all kinds of amazing things can happen because the music gets much more exciting when you're playing it in two or three, which is why I think Jesus said, when two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there. It has to be a relationship. There's no guru in this new transformation. There are just human wrecks, divinely inspired, helping each other into a vast relationship with the one that is all relationship <laughs> so everybody listening is part of the one listening to itself right through us right. and through what we're not saying and through the joy that we're sharing which uh, makes me think about Moving on in this chapter on uh, 285, where you see, I mean, you know, it's obvious we've said this 100 ways to Sunday, but here it is. God is always here. Rumi says, God is always here. And you say it, I say, God is always here. They all say it. We all say it. We can feel it in moments. Sometimes we fall out of feeling it, but here it is. I remember once being on a bus in Ladakh, which is in the Himalayas, and this came very clear to me because there was a child on his mother's lap, and the child was creating and screaming and shouting and yelling and howling as if it had been abandoned at the side of the road and was being eaten by rabid dogs. And it was that bad. Mm. And all the mother did was just stroke the back of the child. She didn't condemn it or say, you beastly little thing, or slap it or anything like that, because these are civilized, deeply awake people. She just went on stroking the back of the child. And then something absolutely amazing happened. Slowly the child stopped indulging these melodramatic theatrics of abandonment and turned and looked into its mother's eyes and stopped and smiled. The mother's always there and she's always stroking our backs. And we indulge our melodrama of abandon, loss, death, how dare you, oh my God, I need more money, all the nonsense of the ego. And all she does is to say, in the silence, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And eventually we get so exhausted with our theatrics that we actually turn around and look at her directly, look into her eyes, at which moment we realize that we've never been separate. Mm -hmm. Separation was never real. It's just in our heads or in our wounding that we feel like we're separate in that human condition, the human condition. Yes. You... I, this takes us so beautifully into this next uh, chapter. I can't believe you and I, we, we, we could do this for a month, couldn't we? Uh, and yes, by the sure. way, my, my, my producer says that we can go later. Can you go a little longer than uh, I have one a session? four o'clock appointment, but I would love to. Let's do it. This, well, let's do it again. Okay, I let's do it again. I will do it to you till the end of the world. Oh, you're so sweet. I love this. I, well, well, then we won't rush. We won't rush forward. We're on chapter. No, don't rush kind of, forward. This is too exciting. This is wonderful. So we'll we'll keep going until we have to stop, and then we'll yes. uh, book you as soon as possible. Because um, I don't like to. I don't want to lose the thread. You know, I don't. I'd, I'd like no, it to be sooner than than as soon as we can do it. How's that? Yes, no. I'd love that. Anything yeah. to you. Oh, thank you. I feel that way toward you. Hmm. Wow. I've got tears in my eyes. <laughs> mm. um, I have a picture of you and I. Really? When you got your award uh, from... Um, oh, God, yes, from when I was elected 
something right. or other by the humanities team, right? That's right. That's right. And but I was I there. Was, and I was sitting next to you. I was sitting to your left. Uh, yeah. I was sitting to your left. Do you remember uh, uh, Burnett? Yes, I do. Yep. Then we did some pictures and stuff. Anyway, I should send that to you so you have a picture. I would love picture. that. I'll do that. Oh, well, I'm on this chapter four, and I'm loving um, the light of love, honoring the divine within, which is, of course, all that we've been leading ourselves to. Um, yeah. Just love all of this. You're talking about the authentic, direct path. Can you yes. give us a... Yeah. Well, all the great spiritual pioneers have known that in order for a liberated and embodied divine humanity, Humanity has to claim and live in direct connection with the divine. Mm -hmm. And the systems that stress mediation, the guru systems and the priest systems, have now clearly revealed that they're bankrupt. What's absolutely necessary for the whole human race, I believe at this moment, if it's possible, yes. is to claim what all the great mystics come to know, which is that God is here inside us and around us at all moments, and that you are born into original blessing and original connection. And all you need to do is to start humbly the practices that will enable you to realize that connection and work in terms of your own temperament with whatever way you want to take into the divine. If you want to be a Buddhist, be a Buddhist. If you want to be a Hindu, be a Hindu. If you want to be a Christian, be a Christian. But realize that there are be just ways in and claim your original divine blessing, claim the truth of which all the mystics of all the traditions proclaim, which is that God is here and God is around you, and start doing the work to make that living, real, total, authentic to yourself. And then laugh wildly, because <laughs> you will be directly instructed by the presence itself in dreams, in books that fall open at the right pages, in amazing people that you meet on in bus stands, in turning the radio on when you think you're getting the rock music and actually re receiving some extraordinary message because the whole universe is waiting for you to realize who you are and is waiting to give you extraordinary confirmation of the depths of how much you are loved and how much you can rely on the divine directly to bring you into your true mission, your true life, your true purpose. It's such a beautiful, I mean, I, you talk about, this is perfect because we're talking about Matthew Fox with you um, and we're going to all tune into that. Um, I this, hope it's, so. it's, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. Uh, we'll make sure we put it on our website too so people can uh, know about it. Actually, I'm on that mailing list, so I knew that was coming up and I was going to mention it today. The Christian Please. Path... This is a very big adventure we're on, and we need support because you can't do this alone. You know, we're all in this together. We need each other. Absolutely. Absolutely. And those of us that are certainly dedicated our lives to, to this kind of growth and development. And, uh, and, and, and I, you know, I feel particularly fond of Christianity because it's what I grew up in, although I love the other, you know, the mystics of all the traditions are so beautiful and they all basically say almost the same thing, just from a different, like you said, pane of glass. Uh, but it, it's, it's special to me. Well, there's to something find... about the particular emphasis of Christianity on action, on active compassion, on really putting your life on the line to put love into action that is absolutely sacred and unique to the Christ with an intensity that I don't think any other teacher matched. Other teachers did amazing things, had amazing awakenings. Jesus came as a lens through which the power of all kinds of awakenings could be focused on loving action to transform the world. That's why the Jesus message, the Jesus voice is so important for the future of the planet. Not because everybody's being told to become a Christian, but because without hearing that voice to make love real, without hearing that challenge to take your deepest spiritual awakenings and help them to prompt your most compassionate action, the richness of what's available to us as human beings will not be available, and we'll never make actual the enlightened state, so we'll never embody it, and we'll never then join with the evolutionary will of the divine to see this world transformed into the kingdom queendom. Mm. 
I'm just feeling that again when you talk. You, you say here, so the authentic direct path unites the, deci the disciplines that enable us to enter into our transcendent origin, as well as to revel in and honor our sacred emergence, which is what you're talking about. Well, what the direct path does fundamentally is to enable you to connect with the transcendent origin so that you can enact its laws and truths in your imminent identity, because God is both light and form. Mm -hmm. Light creates the forms, lives in and as the forms, so you are a form with a light origin. So you partake of the double nature of God in the one. Mm -hmm. And when you claim your full transcendent origin and your full imminent radiance, you become a part, a small part of the great ocean of God, a drop of the great ocean of light, radioactive with that ocean's power and that ocean's love and that ocean's ability to act with skillful means in reality. This is the great evolutionary shift that is being offered by the divine to humanity. And we're going to have to die to get there to all of our false assumptions of the ego and also all of the false separations that the religions have set up. And it's going to be agonizing and horrible. It already is. But it's not going to kill us. It's going to rebirth us. Mm. And that's important to remember, isn't it? Oh, it's essential because it will look like death. And it will be death of one kind of human being. But the death process is not to destroy humanity, but to rebirth humanity in its divine truth. And the direct path, as understood by all the mystics of all the traditions, is the way in which that process can be as profound as possible. If you stay connected to the mystery, the mystery will give you the strength and the courage to bear whatever you have to bear to be able to birth it in yourself. Well, I can't believe this, but you and I have, uh, it's time to stop. <laughs> and I don't want to, but I hear you have another appointment and, uh, and, and we're going to do this again soon. And I'm marking where we stopped on the beginning of this chapter, chapter four, and everyone needs to have this book. You could be reading along with us. It's Andrew Harvey, Radical Passion, Sacred Love and Wisdom in Action. I'm looking at your picture. Hi, Andrew. Um, Hi. <laughs> um, and well, everyone... Thank you so much for doing this. And everybody's been inspired by whatever we've been saying. Could you please go on to ChristPathSeminar.org Look yes. at what Matthew and I are up to, and if it's in your deepest will, please, please sign up so that we can share with you what we're doing. It won't cost you much, and you can put it on a podcast and absolutely live with it. It's only $50 for a whole weekend, and Joanna Macy is going to be there to participate with us. Join us. Come and help birth the living one. Oh, lovely. Thank you for inviting us and everyone who's listening, and we're going to put it out on our uh, website and Andrew, it was such a pleasure as always, and uh, we'll look forward to picking up where we left off and continuing this wonderful journey with you. And blessings on uh, to tell Matthew Fox hello. And, I will. Uh, and you guys have a great time, and I'll be watching. Um, Thank you. And, uh, and you God take bless care your work, and God bless everybody listening. May we all go to the next level in the next minute or two. Absolutely. Those veils. <laughs> what those veils, baby. Dancing dancing in the wildness. Dancing in the wildness. That's us. Yes. So, and in the peace. Absolutely. So blessings, Together. Andrew. Thank you so much. And we'll speak soon again. We'll send you uh, a link to figure out what works with your schedule and we'll look forward to it. And thank you everyone for tuning in as we had such a delightful interview with our friend Andrew Harvey. We talked about radical passion today, sacred love and wisdom in action. And if you do not own this book, please buy it and read through chapter four or whatever. Um, and that's what we'll be picking up on. Uh, and everyone, please don't forget your ultimate life plan.com forward slash launch and you get all those wonderful gifts from all those wonderful people who who were so kind to give me uh, things to give away with my book uh and as always thank you for being here i feel your energy and it's lovely to know we're connected uh please send me emails let me know what you'd like what you need questions for andrew for next time questions for me uh info